This is probably the most anticipated video of the year, so let's dive right in and see which products are the best for 2023. And the Steel MS250 chainsaw definitely deserves to make the top 10 list. Just like all the other chainsaw brands tested, the Steel MS250 has an 18 inch bar. If you're new to the channel, I buy all the products tested to ensure an unbiased review without any pressure from manufacturers. Before testing the cutting speed and overall performance, I first measured the sprocket speed on each of the chainsaws. And the steel is by far the highest revving saw at 14,800 RPM. And the chainsaw with the highest sprocket speed was the steel MS250 at almost 15,000 RPM. The Husqvarna finished in second at 13,072 RPM. In the second test, all the chainsaws were compared for maximum torque using this tester I put together. The tester will keep track of the maximum downward force placed on the test log. During the test, I applied more and more downward force until each of the chainsaw chains stopped moving. Most of the chainsaws made it to around 24 to 27 pounds of downward force when their chains came to a stop. However, the steel MS250 made it to 37 pounds or about 10 pounds more of downward force compared to the other brands. So the higher chain speed and the higher torque should result in more cutting speed compared to the competition. And the steel isn't the lightest saw in the lineup, but it is less than a pound heavier than the Ryobi, Husqvarna, and Echo at 12 and a half pounds. Bench testing really helps understand the capability of products, but so does actually testing the products as they're designed to be used. So in the next test, the saws were compared for cutting speed through a log that I put together using nine 4x4s. While the very affordable $140 Salem Master performed well with the cutting speed of 12.82 seconds to cut through the test log, the steel did even better at under 10 seconds. A more scientific way to test the chainsaws is to add five pounds of weight to the front of the saw. And the chainsaws make more than enough torque to handle five extra pounds of downward force, but the steel still came out on top at 12.67 seconds. And the Salem Master was about four seconds slower than the steel. My property has a lot of hardwood trees. Once again, the steel MS250 came out on top at 16.9 seconds. The Husqvarna is a second slower at 24.25 seconds. I also compared the amount of force required to start the chainsaws. The steel is a high performance chainsaw, but it does require the most arm strength to start the saw at 46.8 pounds of peak pull force on the starter rope. And the steel chainsaw did come out on top in every single test. It is more expensive, but it does seem to be well worth the cost. The Noco GBX155 jump starter also made the top 10 list. I never leave home without a jump starter in my vehicle and this has prevented me from being stranded with a bad battery. In a first test, I removed the original car battery and I replaced it with a completely drained battery. I also disabled the fuel pump on the vehicle so we can hear how quickly the starter spins over the engine. While all the jump starters were able to start the engine, the Noco spun over the engine the fastest. I then bench tested the jump starters using a carbon pile tester. I measured the amps and the volts for each jump starter to come up with the maximum watts. Once again, the Noco came out on top at 896 amps at 7.5 volts. So that works out to 6,720 watts, which is pretty impressive. Several of the other brands performed well in this test, but the Noco outperformed all the other brands by over 1,000 watts. I then used the jump starters to jump start a 454 cubic inch engine in an old RV. And the Noco delivers more than twice as many cranking amps compared to some of the other brands. And the Noco is definitely ready for a lot more of a challenge than the Farmabago. To really put the jump starters to the test, I first removed both batteries from the truck. I then used the jump starters to attempt to start the diesel engine without any help from the battery. And the Noco is by far the most powerful jump starter in the lineup at over 6,700 watts. And the Noco made very easy work of the Cummins and all three back-to-back -back starts. No hesitation on getting the engine going. Very impressive. All of the jump starters can also be used as a power bank to charge cell phones or to provide power to other electronic gadgets. After testing all the jump starters, the Noco finished in second place at 78.4 watt hours, which is more than enough to charge a cell phone several times. And the US Jack 3 ton jack stands earned a spot in the top 10 list for 2023. The US Jack jack stands are made in USA. The jack stands were compared for overall build quality, minimum and maximum height, and then they were compared for performance. Unfortunately, some of the jack stands were very light duty and experienced damage during the first test. So in the first test, I placed a vehicle up on jack stands and then compared the amount of force required to cause the vehicle to fall off the jack stands. As far as safety, the US jack stands outperformed all the other brands by at least 25 pounds in the tip over test. A lot of parking lots and driveways are made of asphalt. When asphalt becomes hot, it can become very soft and jack stands can sink down into the asphalt and become unstable. I'll use these rubber mats to simulate hot asphalt. And the feet of the US jack are really sinking into the rubber mat, but the extra wide stance is making a huge positive difference. And the rubber floor mat really caused a problem for most of the jack stands. However, the US jack jack stands outperformed all the other brands by about 50 pounds. Side to side tip over 
crossover is a huge factor to consider, but so is forward and backward stability. And most of the jack stands have more length than they do width, and that makes a huge difference. And almost all the jack stands perform better on this test than the previous two tests. However, the US Jack jack stands once again came out on top with a very impressive 321 pounds. So the US Jack jack stands outperformed all the other brands by at least 40 pounds. If you're working under a vehicle and something comes into contact with the jack stand handle, the jack stand should remain locked. The jack stand handles have a press pin or a dowel that should shear before unlocking and collapsing. I'll first lower about 800 pounds on the jack stand. The scale on the left will keep track of the downward force from the farm equipment. As I apply a lifting force on the handle, the scale on the left will show a weight reduction as the scale on the right will show the amount of upward force applied to the handle. And the press pin shear is designed on most of the jack stands. Just like we did with the TCE, let's see what happens if a person forgets to use the safety pins with the Daytona. And things seem to be going just fine for the Daytona, but the press pin didn't break. Wow, I did not expect that. In the final test, I tested the amount of downward force that each jack stand can handle. Several of the other jack stands did withstand more downward force than the US jack. However, the US jack still performed very well at 9,500 pounds, which is a lot higher than its 3-ton rating. Since all of the jack stands did exceed their 3-ton rating, I won't include this as a performance objective as a factor when rating the jack stands. And a US Jack came out on top with an average finish at first place in all three categories. And a Bubba Kinetic Energy Rope easily made the top 10 list. Have you ever had a vehicle get stuck? Fortunately, there are Kinetic Energy Ropes which are designed to reduce the shock load when trying to pull someone out of the ditch. And the Bubba Rope is very stretchy at only 400 pounds at a foot. And the Bubba Rope has by far the most stretch yet at only 1,130 pounds at 2 feet. And it's at 1,931 pounds at 3 feet. And 2,887 pounds at 4 feet is about 2,000 pounds less than the Sergeant Knots. And the Bubba Rope is only at 4,682 pounds at 5 feet. And the Bubba Rope is the first rope in the lineup to make it to 6 feet at 7,000 pounds. After measuring to see which rope offers the most stretch and the least amount of shock load, I then torture tested the ropes. I connected one end of the rope to a full-size SUV and the other end to a tree. I then backed up the vehicle 7 feet and then drove forward quickly to simulate pulling a stuck vehicle out of the mud. After 25 pulls, I then once again measured the length of each rope without tension. After 25 impacts, the Bubba Rope did experience the most permanent rope stretch. So the question is, is the Bubba Rope still the stretchiest rope? And the Bubba Rope is by far the stretchiest rope at 72 inches at 7,000 pounds when it was new. And the Bubba Rope is still the stretchiest rope at 56 inches after 25 pulls. While some of the other ropes experience less permanent stretch, the Bubba Rope is still the stretchiest rope. Since it does offer less shock load than the other brands, let's see if we can get Cousin Eddie's Farmabago unstuck. And the Bubba Rope made very easy work of the Farmabago. If you're looking to buy a welder, you might consider the Yes Welder brand MIG Welder at a very affordable price of around $360. And the size of the welder box seems perfect. It's not too large or too small, but still offers plenty of space for a 10-pound roll of wire. I first tested the welders for minimum and maximum current. The Yes Welder didn't perform as well as the Lincoln or the Izuno for low current performance. However, it still offers capability for welding at under 100 amps. I compared the Yes Welder against six other brands, including the $1,150 Vulcan, and the $2,300 Lincoln. When it comes to maximum current, the Yes Welder performed very well at 211 amps. A big thanks to Virgil, who's a professional welder, for helping me with this review. In the first test, Virgil used 0.035 inch solid wire with argon CO2 shielding gas to butt weld quarter inch steel plate. And the Yes Welder is definitely producing more amps of current than all the previous brands. That was actually pretty good. You can see actually in the material that you're burning a lot deeper than some of the other ones. Pretty good welder. This one here did a good job. Okay. I like it. I'll go ahead and grind off the weld that's just above the steel plate so we can measure penetration. I folded each of the test pieces and measured the area with the deepest penetration for each of the brands. When it comes to weld penetration, the expensive Vulcan and very expensive Lincoln welders outperformed the Yes Welder, but the Yes Welder wasn't too far behind. In the next test, the welders were compared for performance welding 0.035 flux core wire. And the Yes Welder is producing a nice and smooth wire speed without much surging compared to some of the other brands. Nice penetration, smooth. This is another one I would love to have. Nice little weld. Yes Welder. This one here I really enjoyed running. I like to weld hot and fast. Did a great job on burning through. We had a 330 second gap on all of these. As in for fill on both ends, did a good job. Tying into your edges, I would hit it with a grinder a little bit and put another cap pass right across the top of that. I put together a tester to test the strength of the welds. The scale will measure the amount of force it takes to break the test piece. With the cap weld pass, the Yes Welder would have been even stronger, but 5,143 pounds is a very good performance. Placing a cap weld on all the test pieces would have helped, but the welding machines performed very well except for the War King. Then on the next test, the welders were 
compared for performance welding 20 gauge metal which is about the same thickness as a car fender. The welding machines will be set up with 0.03 inch flex core wire and the machines will be plugged into a 120 volt outlet. Virgil definitely does not recommend using this approach for welding sheet metal. However, I've asked him to weld this way just to show the lower limit of each machine. I don't like the way this one welds on thinner stuff because when you're trying to do spot weld, because then it will flare out and lay down flatter and nicer and smoother. When I'd hit it and then let off, it would actually fuse that wire all the way back up. That's the part that I do not like. I like to have the wire consistently out there instead of it being all the way up. It just runs a lot hotter. So the Yes welder probably runs too hot for auto body work, but it does an amazing job on thick material. The final test was a torture test running the welders on the highest setting for five minutes. And not all the welders lasted five minutes, but the Yes welder did just fine. At least once or twice per year, one of my vehicles experiences a windshield chip. Fortunately, the Permatex car windshield repair kit is very affordable at around $13 and it made the top 10 list. After spending a full day practicing with each repair kit, I spent a full day repairing windshield chips with seven different brands. After making all the repairs, I hired a professional windshield technician to make a professional repair and then to grade the results of each windshield repair kit. So we're gonna give that one an A. And then I'm gonna say, I think I liked this one next. While the $319 Clear Shield kit performed a little bit better, the Permatex finished in a close second place at a very affordable price of $13 for the kit. To test the adhesive strength of each product, I created some test pieces using glass coasters and test tubes. And the Permatex outlasted the glass. And the glass broke at 20.6 pounds. I also prepared another test piece. I applied the resins and covered each of the resins with the plastic curing film. They've had several of hours to cure in direct sunlight. So let's use the most hardness test to compare each of the resins. All the curing strips have been removed. Once again, the Permatex performed very well on the hardness test with the most hardness score of three. So the hardest resins include the Rain-X, Permatex, and Clear Shield resins, which required a number three pick to cause scratches. While the Clear Shield kit did perform better than the Permatex kit, it also cost $319. At a very affordable price of $13, the Permatex kit seems like a great value. And the All-American Lawnmower Blade Sharpener definitely deserves a spot on the top 10 list. I compared the All-American against five other lawnmower blade sharpeners. For the first test, I bought four new blades. The factory ground edge has some pretty deep grooves and it just isn't very sharp. The ideal angle for sharpening a lawnmower blade is 30 degrees. And the angle of the new blade is 27.6 degrees. I then measured the amount of time it took to clean up the blade edge on a new blade. And the All-American was by far the fastest sharpener at only 8 seconds. Not only was the All-American blade the fastest sharpener, it also performed very well at forming a blade edge very close to 30 degrees. To really put the sharpeners to the test, I ground the edge of the lawnmower blades first, and then I added some dings to the blade edge to simulate rock chips. And the blade for the All-American is starting out at 800 grams. Of all the sharpening systems, the All-American seems like the easiest to use. 14 passes across the blade edge and the All-American is finished in around 30 seconds. And the blade edge is very sharp and consistent and as expected there's a nice burr that's formed on the bottom side of the blade. And the blade edge is just over 30 degrees which is pretty close to perfect. The All-American started off at 800 grams and is now down 8 grams to 792. And the All-American proved to be by far the fastest lawnmower blade sharpener. It sharpened the blade in only 30 seconds compared to more than twice the length of time for the $1,200 sharpener. While the All-American is sort of expensive at around $285, it does an amazing job and it should last a very long time. And the next product to make the top 10 list is AT205, which is a stop leak product designed to stop engine, power steering, transmission, and hydraulic leaks. AT205 is made in USA. I don't ever want to add anything to an engine that'll cause engine damage. So I first compared each of the stop leak products mixed with motor oil to measure the ability to provide proper lubrication. And there's a lot of friction taking place with the energy use meter at over 570 watts. And the test pin is very hot and is blowing off some steam. And the AT205 test pin has a pretty large wear scar at 8.42 millimeters. So AT205 offers less lubricity than motor oil, but it seems safe enough to use and well worth it if it can stop an oil leak. Let's place the gasket material and the O-rings into motor oil and let's heat it up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours. And the O-ring that was not exposed to hot oil has a hardness of 75. So after two hours in the oil, the O-ring now has a hardness of 89.5. So there's been a lot of damage. Before the heat exposure, the O-ring was 0.206 inches and it now has a thickness of 0.194. So that's about a 6% loss in thickness, which will definitely cause an oil leak. Let's see if these oil additives can restore the O-rings back to the original like new condition. Before we heat the oil, let's measure the weight 
weight of the measuring cups along with everything in it. To simulate engine operating conditions, let's heat up a 50-50 oil and additive blend along with the hardened seals and gasket to around 200 degrees for two hours. It's been right at two hours, so once the container's at room temperature, we'll weigh them once again. And the AT205 separates from the oil and it experienced a lot of evaporative loss at 2.21 grams. But the real question is, does it actually soften hard rubber seals? And the O-ring is almost back to its original size at 0.2055 inches. Very impressive. And the O-ring is actually softer than new at 65.5. And the AT205 came in on top for expanding the thickness of the O-ring at 0.2055 inches. The AT205 also came out on top for softening the rubber O-ring with the lowest hardness score of 65.5. The rubber fiber gasket is a lot thinner, so let's see if the thinner material helps some of the products perform better. I'll use the pointed end of the pick to measure how much force it takes to puncture the gasket. So after two hours of intense heat, the rubber fiber gasket is very hard and it takes 798 grams to puncture the gasket. And the AT205 did a terrific job of softening the gasket at 430, the best yet. Once again, the AT205 came out on top at 430 grams. So after all the testing, the AT205 came out on top with an average finish at first place. If you're looking for a generator that can also power up electronic devices safely, the Honda EU2200i made the top 10 list. I compared the Honda with the Gen Max and the Harbor Freight Predator. This regular generator does not offer true sine wave electricity and it can cause damage to sensitive electronic devices. Fortunately, the Honda, Predator, and Gen Max performed very well in this test. In the next test, the generators were compared for voltage drop in eco mode. Starting off in eco mode, the Gen Max is at 123.8 volts. Powering up the space heater caused the voltage to drop to 99. Testing the Honda, and the voltage dropped to 111.7, the best yet. In eco mode, the Honda came out on top with the least amount of voltage drop at 111.7 volts. In eco mode, Honda had the fastest recovery time for the voltage drop in 2.77 seconds. I then measured the fuel efficiency without using eco mode. When it's not in the eco mode, the Honda is not quite as fuel efficient as the competition. In eco mode, the Predator and the Gen Max are moving around quite a bit. So running in eco mode really helped the generators with fuel efficiency. And the Honda is the first generator out of fuel in 61 minutes. And the Gen Max outlasted the Honda by 30 seconds. And the Predator is finally out of fuel at 62.5 minutes or about a minute longer than the Gen Max. So the economy mode saved all the generators quite a bit of fuel. So running in the economy mode, all the generators are pretty competitive, but the Predator came out on top in 62.5 minutes. I found a very quiet place to compare the loudness of each of the generators. There's definitely no traffic noise or any noise from urban areas. The noise level is in the mid 30s. With the exhaust facing the sound meter, the Honda is the quietest at 50.2 decibels in eco mode. Under load, the Honda is at 59.5 decibels or about two decibels less than the Predator and five less than the Gen Max. I rotated the position of the Honda 90 degrees and the Honda is the best yet at 59.5 decibels. With the exhaust facing away from the sound meter, 57.2 decibels. So the Honda is the quietest of the three generators with an average exhaust noise of 58.9 decibels. I also measured all three generators for vibration. And the Honda vibrates the least of the three brands at very close to 9 meters per second square. So the Honda did the best but all three brands performed well. I also compared spark plug appearance and the Honda spark plug looked the best. All the generators call for 100 hour oil change intervals. They all have close to 98 hours of run time to total and 96 hours on the current oil. The Predator shut down to being low on oil at around 49 hours of use and I had to add oil. I did not add oil to the Honda or the Gen Max. I then sent off oil to an oil testing lab to look for wear metals inside of the used oil. Once again, the Honda came in on top showing the lowest levels of wear metals. While the Honda is expensive, it is by far the best generator. And the Drill Doctor 750X is a fantastic drill bit sharpener and it made this year's list. The Drill Doctor is made in USA. I compared the drill bit sharpeners using 3 8 inch drill bits. I used a drill press with the wheel attached to the lever arms as well as a rope and 25 pounds of weight. That works out to 175 pounds of downward force on the drill bit. And the new twist drill bit looks great. With around 175 pounds of downward force on the new drill bit, it's making very quick work of the mild steel. And the brand new drill bit drilled through the half inch mild steel in 16.5 seconds. I then dulled eight brand new drill bits by drilling into concrete. And they definitely experienced a lot of damage. I actually sharpened two different drill bits with the drill doctor. I sharpened the first drill bit to 118 degrees. The second drill bit was sharpened to 135 degrees and I created a split point which is a really impressive capability for a drill bit sharpener. And the drill doctor is almost as fast at sharpening a drill bit as the much more expensive Prius on. And the drill doctor's 135 degree split point is cutting through the half inch steel like a hot knife through butter. And 7.9 seconds is the fastest time yet. Very impressive. And the hole looks just as smooth as the drill doctor's 118 degree drill bit. And the drill doctor's 135 degree split point held up very well. So the drill doctor's 135 degree split point drill bit made the 
fastest hull of all the brands, drilling through half-inch steel in only 7.9 seconds. So when it comes to sharpening tools, sharpness durability is a huge factor to consider. On the second hole, the split point 135 degree drill doctor sharpened bit is still the fastest at 7.7 .7 seconds. So if you're looking for a drill bit sharpener that can sharpen a drill bit quickly and create a lasting sharpness, the drill doctor is very impressive. And the final product to make the top 10 list is the Milwaukee Tire Inflator. If you're in a hurry or running late to work, a low tire being inflated by a slow tire inflator can really slow you down. Let's kick off our first test seeing how long it takes to inflate a 15 inch car tire from 30 to 36 psi. Both the Rigid and the Milwaukee claim to be the fastest 18 volt tire pump, but there can only be one champ. And the Milwaukee is finished in 18 seconds or about twice as fast as the Rigid. Very impressive. Topping off a tire at a relatively low pressure, the Milwaukee is the fastest at 18 seconds. In the second test, the tire inflators competed with each other at inflating a completely flat tire to 36 psi. And the Milwaukee once again dominated the competition, inflating the completely flat tire in only two and a half minutes. I then compared the tire inflators for performance, inflating a heavy duty pickup tire from 70 to 80 PSI. Once again, the Milwaukee was by far the fastest at just over a minute and a half. On the final test, I compared the fastest three tire inflators once again on the heavy duty load range E tire. This time, the tire was completely flat, and the Milwaukee was once again the fastest of the three inflators, pumping up the completely flat tire to 80 PSI in very close to 12 minutes. The other two tire inflators needed five minutes longer to inflate the tire. 2023 is flying by so quickly and I always look forward to hearing your feedback. All the videos in this channel, including this one, are viewer suggested. So if you have a video idea, I hope you'll take time to leave a comment. Thanks so much for watching. Please take care and look forward to next time.